So that's our idea for uh, Huygens principle. And then there's another picture of what happens when you go through a slit on the next page. Yeah, why don't you have your own copy in front? On page 574. Okay, so we were already talking about the fact that when you pass the light through a slit, so this is a plane wave, so it's basically going straight ahead. So if it was a bullet, it would keep going straight ahead, but you can see at the edges it's kind of curving over here. And here's the explanation. This is pretty much what I have on the board, but it's a better picture. So it's showing that in the middle, all the little wavelets even each other out. But when you get to the end, there's nothing to even out this last one, so you end up with a curve on the end. But so at the very end, it's curving. What about these ends, though? Which ends? Oh, those would be curving, too. That's right. It should be, so it should, there should be more and more curve the further out that you get, right. so basically. So that's right. I think the listener here would hear it. But... That's right. So, but a listener right here would not hear it. Oh, if he's too... Yeah, because notice that the curve, or uh, basically, if the person is, say, well... Wouldn't he hear it, because like these ones would be better? Yeah, that seems right. Huh. How do we uh, think about that? Yeah, it seems like uh, the curve is hitting uh, everywhere there. Uh, yeah, it seems like it starts bending immediately when it gets outside. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to think about that. All right, all right, but we can see that it starts bending when it gets to the slit over here. Now, um, the key thing here is notice that here we have a smaller slit, and notice that here the bending is much more pronounced, and there's very little planar region. There's almost no planar region. In fact, if the slit is so, the point is, if the slit is very, very narrow, then there's really only room for like say one point source. Mm -hmm. So you just have a, you can have, as an approximation, you can think there's almost only room for one point source. So the whole you only get the sphere. You don't have any other spheres to cancel out over here. Okay. So here, um, the uh, here with this very tiny little slit, you wouldn't. Uh, it would seem like it's all bent. Whereas here, the bending is only at the edges, and there's a big flat oh, portion in the middle. Is That's right. So this is the idea that we were talking about before. The diffraction is negligible when the hole is big compared to the wavelength. So again, I said um, the wave characteristics don't matter when the wavelength is small, but small is a relative term. You have to compare it to something. Well, you compare it to the other things in the system. Well, the other thing in the system besides the wave here is the slit length. So the wave, the wave characteristics are not very important when the wavelength here is very small compared to the slit length. Um, on the other hand, uh, here, the uh, wave characteristics are quite important. Okay, so for example, yeah, there we go, uh, and it's uh, it's bending like that. Okay, so those are those will be good pictures to study, and maybe you might need to come up with those during the test. I basically have those on the board, but those are those are neater pictures that they have there in the textbook in the chapter on interference and diffraction. Okay, now. No, yeah, so actually we're still not quite ready for the practice test. So the next thing is, what is the source of electromagnetic radiation? What's the ultimate source of electromagnetic radiation? Like the charge? Like what charge? about the charge? What types of charges create electromagnetic radiation? Well, if it's a moving charge, it'll make the magnetic field. But then isn't it just, if the charge is there, it'll give off an electric field, and then doesn't the electric field... Oh, the, it has to be the changing flux of the electric field makes the magnetic field with that complete... Um, right. Well. So, so what do we need? We, it's not good enough to have a charge. And it's not even good enough to have a moving charge. We need accelerated charges. Ele okay. Yeah, electromagnetic radiation comes from accelerating charges. Electromagnetic radiation comes from accelerating charges which are changing their movement. Um, and we can think of this as, say, we know that uh, material substances have all these little dipoles inside them. Material substances have all these little atomic or molecular dipoles uh, inside of them. So let's think about uh, a little dipole. Remember, a dipole is a separation of positive and negative charge. 
So here I have a little dipole, a little separation of positive and negative charge. And basically, generally speaking, the electromagnetic radiation comes from an oscillation of a dipole like this. So we can imagine if the, if the chalk boulder is the dipole, we can imagine the dipole oscillating back and forth like this, say vertically on the board. Well, that's going to give it a uh, constantly uh, accelerated movement. The movement is going to be accelerating there. Because when it's moving up, there has to be a downward acceleration to bring it to a halt. And then when it's moving down, there has to be an upward acceleration to bring it to a halt. Um, and uh, I guess actually when it first starts moving up, it's accelerating up. And then there has to be a downward acceleration to slow it down. And then it, uh, the downward acceleration speeds it up. And then an upward acceleration to pull it back. Kind of like when we're working with a spring before. Anyway, so there has to be an acceleration to constantly keep speeding this up and then slowing it down when it gets to the end. We know that... Um, it's going to be moving very quickly when it gets to, say, this equilibrium point, but then it has to slow down and change direction when it gets to the extreme points of its fluctuation. So there has to be a, uh, uh, an acceleration to keep uh, speeding it up towards the midpoint and then slowing it down when it gets to extremes. Okay, so this is certainly, uh, this, uh, so certainly an oscillating dipole would certainly qualify as accelerated charges. An oscillating dipole would certainly qualify as accelerating charges. Um, and now what is this going to do? Well, it's going to create uh, changing electric and uh, magnetic fields. This is going to create uh, changing electric and uh, magnetic fields. I guess it's easiest to see, uh, it's certainly going to create uh, changing magnetic fields. It's easiest to see it creates changing magnetic fields because we know the magnetic field depends on the speed of the charges, right? We know that the magnetic field uh, sick. just say that um, because this is constantly changing its motion, we would uh, expect it to create these changing electric and magnetic fields. Okay, and then remember, remember what we talked about when we were talking about Maxwell's laws, we saw that a changing electric field causes a magnetic field, induces a magnetic field, and we saw that a changing magnetic field causes a electric field. So once we get the wave going, it kind of feeds on itself. We actually spent uh, maybe half an hour talking about that in one of our previous sessions. Remember, we looked at uh, Maxwell's laws. And we saw that uh, the, uh, there was an expression for electric field that depended on the derivative of the magnetic field. And there was an expression for the magnetic field that depended on the derivative of the electric field. Um, and so when we have a change in the electric field, that causes the magnetic field. And when we have a change in the magnetic field, that causes, induces the electric field. So the, um, once we set up this changing electric and magnetic field, it kind, of fe it kind of propagates itself. Okay, but the original source here has to be this accelerated charge. The original thing that gets us going has to be the accelerated charge. Now here's another important point. If the, uh, so I've been imagining here that the dipole is oscillating up and down. So which way is the electromagnetic radiation going to propagate? Well, it turns out that the radiation always propagates perpendicular to the direction of oscillation. There's a question in the sample example. You'll need to use this idea. So the dipole is oscillating up and down, but the wave is going to go shooting out like this. By the way, notice this is not the only direction that's perpendicular to this oscillation. Any direction 
that's kind of coming into or out of the board here would also be perpendicular. So the wave could actually be going out in a whole series of lines, but we'll just stick to this line that's in the plane of the board. Here's the line in the plane of the board that's perpendicular to the oscillation. The key thing is there is no propagation along the direction of oscillation. There is no EM wave going in these directions. The wave doesn't go in this direction. It goes perpendicular to how the dipole is oscillating. This is kind of related to that other picture we saw in the previous session. Remember there was a graph that showed how the electric field was oscillating up and down on the x-axis. Oh, yeah. And it showed that the magnetic field then was oscillating uh, into the page and out of the page on, the, uh, on I guess they called it the y-axis. Uh, and then they showed the direction of propagation of the light was perpendicular to both of those um, on the x-axis. Okay, so this is kind of a similar uh, idea over here. Um, where the direction of wave propagation is different to how the dipole is oscillating. That's related to the idea that the wave propagation is going to be perpendicular to how the electric field is oscillating and perpendicular to how the magnetic field is oscillating.